So in this part of our notes, we're going to look at how organisms retrieve information and transmit information. So basically, we're going to look at the ways organisms communicate and respond. So we're going to look at how organisms learn and how they behave. So we're going to look at different behaviors. So first we're going to take a look at behaviors, and behaviors will fall into one of two categories. Behaviors are either innate, that means that you're born with the ability to do them, or these behaviors are learned. No matter whether the behavior is innate or it's learned, these all arise due to natural selection. So those that are born with the ability to, have to do certain behaviors or the ability to learn, those are the organisms that are going to be able to survive better and reproduce. Another way to say an innate behavior is to say instinct. So here are some examples of behaviors that are just due to instinct. If you have a bird that is not around other birds, once it reaches maturity, it can fly even though it doesn't have another bird to teach it how to do it. So that's just an innate behavior. There's many reflexes that we have that are considered innate behaviors. We are born with the ability to do it. All mammals have a sucking reflex, so they're able to nurse within minutes of being born. Humans have what's called the moral reflex, and so if a baby experiences a, a sudden drop or a sudden movement, then they'll flail their arms out sideways, and that's what is known as the moral reflex. Another innate behavior can be categorized as a fixed action pattern. So a fixed action pattern is innate behavior. So again, these organisms aren't taught to do this. And once this behavior is triggered, then it's actually going to continue until the behavior is complete. So a good example is with a goose. If a goose sees an egg or anything resembling an egg outside of its nest, then it's going to use its head and its, its bill to pull that egg back in. And it does so in a series of movements. Now, even when in, it's in the process of moving this egg back to the nest, if you pull the egg away, then the goose will even continue to make these movements until its bill, its head, reaches back um, to, to the nest. So um, again, so you can see that you're going to see these behaviors and there's going to see it's a, it's a pattern of behaviors and they will continue until those behaviors are complete. Um, another good example is with a red-bellied stickleback fish and I've seen this organism referenced a lot on AP tests. And so whenever the stickleback fish sees an underbelly of another fish, a red underbelly, then there's a series of behaviors that it uses to defend its territory. And this can even be induced with anything, even just like a, a wooden model that has like a kind of that underbelly painted. Um, that's going to be a stimulus that will cause this red-bellied stickleback fish to do these series of movements. So the next behavior we're going to talk about are behaviors that are due to imprinting. So imprinting is something that is innate. You're born with the ability to do it. When imprinting is occurring, there's a behavior that's going to be acquired, and it has to be acquired during a critical period. So for example, whenever ducks first hatch out or, or goslings, the first object that moves, they recognize as their mother. And so one behavior associated with that is wherever this object goes, they will follow it. If no object moves for them to imprint on um, during a certain amount of time, then they'll never imprint on an object. So that's what I mean by this behavior has to be acquired during a critical period. Um, if it's outside of a certain critical, outside of the critical period, then this behavior will never occur. And like I said, this is irreversible. So now we're going to get into different ways that organisms learn. So the first type of learning we're going to talk about is associative learning. So this is whenever an animal learns that two events are related. So, for example, you have learned that when the bell rings, then it's time to leave. There's another famous experiment that was conducted by a scientist named Pavlov. And so what he would do was ring a bell and he would present dogs with food. And so he did this repeatedly and eventually whenever he would ring the bell, he would not present any food, but the dogs would begin to salivate. So 
that is a behavior that's actually associated to another event, which is the ringing of that bell. There's another type of associative learning, which is called operant conditioning. And this is whenever you have learning and it's due to uh, basically rewards and punishment. So one way that I can remember this is um, Oprah, oftentimes, she would bring in people that have done good deeds and she would reward them with something. So um, that's a way to reinforce good behavior is to offer a reward for it. Habituation is whenever organisms learn to disregard meaningless stimuli. So whenever you're driving down a busy highway and you notice deer grazing right beside the highway, that's an example of habituation, is those deer have actually learned to disregard that stimuli. You'll see that organisms that are in parks where there's, there's people around, like squirrels, they become habituated um, and they ignore that stimuli, other people in the area. Observational learning. is just when organisms learn a behavior and they have never experienced before. And then there's innate learning. And that's just when an organism performs a new behavior that they've never experienced before, but that behavior has a positive outcome. So they learn that's a good behavior to have. So um, an example of this is whenever my son opened or he unwrapped a sucker for the first time. He never knew how to unwrap a sucker. He was just playing with it and the wrapper fell off the sucker and then he tasted it and realized how good it was. And so there was a desirable outcome. So he learned this behavior and, and from then on, if he saw a sucker, he knew to unwrap it. So that's an example of where he learned something innately. So now we're going to look at different behaviors and we're going to first focus on social behaviors. And so when you have social systems or you have many organisms living together, sometimes they develop these dominance hierarchies. So that's whenever there's a status relationship. So when we look at lions, we look at um, male gorillas, there's a pecking order and it establishes who is like the top male and who has first access to different resources. Whenever they talk about territoriality, we're just talking about organisms and they defend that territory where they live. An agonistic behavior is a behavior that shows aggression. So um, when you think of an a animal and, and it appears threatened, you're going to see that it's going to probably show its teeth or its hair is going to raise, or it's going to growling. So that is what is meant by an agonistic behavior. Altruism occurs in social groups, and that is where the fitness of one is actually sacrificed, and it's for the good of the, of the others. Now, in this situation, whenever altruism is occurring, it's usually due to individuals that are related. This, often, this does not happen often in situations where organisms are not related. You don't see organisms with altruistic behaviors in those cases. So a good example would be with prairie dogs. And you're, you're going to have a prairie dog that's a, that's a lookout and it's looking for danger. And whenever it sees that, it's going to send out a warning. In the process of doing this, it's actually lowering its fitness because it's letting the predator know where it's at, but this is actually increasing the fitness of the other organisms in the group. So this is an example of altruism. Whenever you have a U social society, remember U means true, like eukaryotic cell means true nucleus. So this is a, a true society. You have a group of individuals and they're dividing tasks. So think of bees. You have the queen bee who lays the egg. You have the workers that will tend the young there's the workers that'll find food. There are those that offer protection to the group. So there's a, a division of labor in that society. So some of these are examples of cooperative behavior. So like altruism, um, that's found in groups that are cooperating. Um, new social societies, there has to be cooperative behaviors for the good of the group. And so cooperative behaviors have you know, come about due to natural selection because it actually increases the fitness of those individuals whenever there's cooperative behavior. So when you have herds and flocks and, and schools of fish, there's advantages there. They can alert others. There's greater defense in large numbers. 
and it even gives them an ability to acquire food. So now we're going to look at, at different ways that organisms communicate. And organisms communicate in um, five different ways, visual, audible, tactile, electrical, and chemical signaling. So even both plants and organisms are, be able, are able to communicate. So when we think of, sometimes when we think of communication, we just think that is something that animals are able to do. But plants are actually able to communicate as well. Now, in order to communicate through chemical signals, so that's the first one we're going to look at, chemical signals, is organisms have to have chemoreceptors. So we're just talking about receptor proteins in a cell membrane that certain chemicals can bind to. So for example, we have chemoreceptors in our nose. So whenever di different chem chemicals bind to those chemoreceptors, then it activates an impulse and that impulse is sent via nerves to your brain and your brain can decipher what it is that you're experiencing. Now, any chemicals that are used to communicate are called pheromones. So, for these different ways of communication, you probably should have one example memorized. Just pick one that's really easy for you to understand and be able to discuss. Like we said, plants actually have the ability to communicate, and they mostly communicate through chemical signaling. So, they will produce chemicals for protection. So a couple examples of this, whenever a plant is being chewed on, upon by a chewing insect, then a, that plant can release a chemical that will actually attract another organism. So in this case, it attracts a wasp. This wasp will lay eggs on this plant, those eggs will hatch out, and they'll actually feed on those chewing insects that are damaging the plant. Another indication of chemical signaling is Again, whenever the plant is being preyed upon, then it can actually cause that plant to express certain genes. And they have to have these genes in the first place to be able to do this, but some plants will express certain genes that produce a toxin. And so then when that toxin becomes concentrated in, in their tissues, it will lead to the death of that chewing insect. Now, there's actually an advantage to producing a toxin only when necessary, because to produce that resource takes additional energy. So not as much energy is consumed if they just are, are producing that toxin whenever that toxin is needed. Lots of times in this situation, uh, those plants will produce a toxin, but they're also releasing other chemicals that are warning nearby plants that aren't getting preyed upon that there's a predator in the area. And those plants will actually express those genes as well and go ahead and start producing those toxins. So they're not going to be preyed upon by those herbivores. Plants can also produce chemicals or pheromones to attract pollinators for reproduction purposes. Okay, so we know that our animals can release pheromones as well. They do that to mark their territory. They do that to attract the opposite sex so they can sexually reproduce. They can detect chemicals and that tells them when a predator is in the area. Also, a good example of where pheromones are used to help organisms locate and acquire food is with ants. Wherever an ant walks, it's actually leaving a chemical trail. And so this represents their nest and this represents a food source. Ants are always trying to find food. And so what will happen is eventually an ant is going to find a food source and it's going to do so in a very direct way. It's going to stumble upon it. Well, it's going to follow its chemical signal back to the nest and deposit that food. Now, other ants might eventually find their way to the food source, but you can see it's a very indirect path. Well, the ant that laid down this very direct path is actually going to travel more times back and forth to the food. And like I said, as it travels, it's depositing these pheromones. It, basically, it's a, it's a more concentrated chemical signal, and more ants are going to follow it. Over time, what we see is all ants will be following that chemical signal because it's a stronger chemical signal and it indicates the most direct path to a food source from the nest. So next we're going to look at visual cues. So we're just looking at communication through sight. Certain flower colors have become more common over time because certain pollinators are actually more attracted to certain colors. So birds are actually attracted to red and yellow. Bees are actually attracted to a different color, but again, Plants are using these visual signals so that they can reproduce. Animals, their visual signals lots of times have to do with agonistic behaviors. 
like baring teeth, staring, the hair that stands up on their back, that's a visual signal. But we also talked about that through sexual selection, there's courtship displays and dances, and also organisms usually have these very colorful features which are more attractive to the opposite sex. So those are examples of visual cues. Auditory is just simply communication through the use of sound. So whenever a ground squirrel that is looking out senses danger, it'll give a series of calls and that warns the others. There's also, animals also use sounds to attract the opposite sex. Tactile just means communication through touch. So something that's really interesting about bees is whenever a bee finds a food source, it comes back to the hive and it does a series of dances and it's communicating to the other bees where this food source is at. Now, this is an example of a visual signal because that dance is performed in the hive and it's dark in the hive. So what is actually happening is as this bee is doing its dance, it's touching other bees and it's communicating with them how far away that food source is and, and how to get to that food source. Another example of where touch is, is is uses communication is with tree hoppers. When one detects danger, then it vibrates the plant that it's on, and that can be detected by other tree hoppers so they know that danger is near. Now, again, just to emphasize, all these behaviors are due to natural selection. The ones that have these behaviors are the ones that are surviving better and reproducing. Now we're just gonna look at animal movement. We are probably gonna do a lab. We're gonna look at different types of animal movement. Mostly we're gonna focus on kinesis versus taxis. So an easy way to remember kinesis is I like to think of as kinesis is that crazy movement. It's not movement towards a stimulus or away from a stimulus. It's just movement haphazardly in all directions. So if you think of whenever you lift the log and those bugs scatter everywhere, they're not really moving towards you or away from you. They're just moving haphazardly in all different directions. So that's an example of movement that's called kinesis. Now with taxis, I like to think of taxis. If you hail a taxi, you are going somewhere. You are either going to go to something or from something. And so there's actually, there's directed movement either towards or away from a stimulus. Whenever you hear migration, you've probably already heard about migration before, then we're talking about movement that's over a long distance and it's due to seasonal changes. Animals migrate uh, to different areas where there's more free energy available at different times of the year. Whenever we talk about animal rhythms, what we're talking about is circadian rhythms. So sometimes you ref this is referred to as your biological clock. So if you travel overseas, then you know that it takes a little bit of time for your biological clock to adjust to their night and day. So circadian rhythms are behaviors, physiological activities that are based on that 24 hour day period. Not all organisms are active at different, uh, at the same time of the day. Animals that are active during the day, those are called diurnal organisms and you've probably heard that organisms that are active at night are called nocturnal. Now, hibernation is a little bit different. That is behavior that's actually aligned to the changes in the season, not really in the 24-hour day. But again, kind of like migration, it gives organisms the chance to get the most free energy available. So they're conserving energy when there's not a lot of free energy, but when free energy is available, then they're more active. 